of course, if you read, and I would really recommend that you do, um, I did this because I heard Professor Chomsky many years ago talk about it and went and read it, the opening and closing statements by Robert Jackson of the Nuremberg Tribunals. Um, it's incredibly enlightening because that was supposed to be the expression of modern justice. And not only did Jackson point out that aggressive war was the kingpin crime, the crime above all others, um, but he also said that the Nuremberg tribunals would have value only if they were applied not only to the defendants in the dock, but also to all the nations here assembled, meaning the United States and its allies. And yet, if you were to cite that and argue that that meant that George Bush and Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld should be prosecuted as war criminals for the aggressive attack on Iraq, you could almost, there's almost nothing you could do that's more self-marginalizing than that. Even people sympathetic to the idea that they should be investigated criminally for the torture regime or for a warrantless eavesdropping somewhat recoil at the idea that they should be held criminally accountable for the at least 100,000 dead innocent Iraqis, I think because they view the act of Congress authorizing it and the large majorities of the American citizenry cheering for it as something that ought to immunize them from that. And it, I think, shows just how lawless we've become that you can't even cite the Nuremberg principles and argue for its applicability in the clearest possible case um, without becoming self-marginalized. Um, just a quick point about assassinations and the like. Um, I certainly agree with Professor Chomsky that from a moral and ethical perspective, there's zero difference between um, sending a sky robot over another country and eradicating the lives of non-citizens um, as opposed to doing that to citizens based upon mere suspicion or even a lack of suspicion, just as a desire to kill them. But I do think there's a practical difference. Um, that is that there is a greater and enhanced danger on several levels when the government begins murdering its own citizens for political dissidents as opposed to citizens of other countries on foreign soil. And the difference is this, I think that, you know, just legalistically, the Supreme Court, for, right or, for better or for worse, right or wrong, has said that the Constitution applies to foreigners on U.S. soil and to American citizens wherever they are found in the world. But more importantly than that is that when the government starts acting against its own citizens, it really can escalate a climate of fear that can lead to political... Um, suppression. And I think that's one of the things that you've really seen in the United States. One of the most striking experiences I've had since I began writing about politics was um, the first time that I ever wrote about WikiLeaks. This was um, back in early 2010. And this was before really almost nobody knew who WikiLeaks was at the time. This was before they had released any of their news-making disclosures inside the United States. They had released several important documents and had exposed wrongdoing among corporations and governments in other parts of the world, but not really in the United States. And nobody, including me, really knew much about them. Um, but the Pentagon had prepared a top-secret report. They literally classified a top-secret in 2008 um, that declared WikiLeaks to be an enemy of the state. And it described ways that they could go about destroying WikiLeaks. And it's incredible because the way in which WikiLeaks has been rendered all but inoperable pretty much comports with the things the Pentagon laid out in this 2008 report. Um, but in any event, in this, two, this 2008 report, this top secret report, um, ironically, was leaked to WikiLeaks, which then published it. Um, <laughs> And the New York Times wrote about it, and the New York Times article basically said there's the Pentagon report that's been leaked that declares WikiLeaks an enemy of the state and talks about ways to destroy it. And I didn't know very much at all about WikiLeaks at the time, but I kind of assumed that any organization that had been targeted that way by the Pentagon was one that merited a lot more attention and probably a lot more encouragement and even support. And so I went and read a lot about them, and I interviewed Julian Assange for... Um, the article that I wrote, and I, I wrote about it, and I posted the audio interview, and at the end, I encouraged people to go and donate to WikiLeaks um, because they had budgetary constraints that were preventing them from going public with a lot of these disclosures. Um, it takes a lot of time and energy to authenticate the documents. One of the things the Pentagon talked about to destroy them was submitting fraudulent documents to them so that when they published it, it would forever destroy their credibility and the f credibility of future disclosures. Um, and in response to my recommendation that people go and donate to them, and I provided a link how people could do that electronically and online and through PayPal, um, dozens of people, literally, told me in many different venues, in the comment section to what I had written, by email, at events like this where I talked to people, that although they agreed wholeheartedly with what I had written about the potential of WikiLeaks to achieve great good, that they were afraid 
of donating money to WikiLeaks, especially electronically, because they would end up on some government list somewhere. Or that they could even be subjected to criminal liability under the extraordinarily broad sub material support for terrorism statutes that Professor Chomsky just talked about. And these were not people prone to wild conspiracy theories. These were very sober Americans who I had interaction with in the past on other issues. A lot of them were. Um, and I could just tell from the way that they were expressing these fears that they were very rational people. And they, these fears were well-grounded. And the reason it was so amazing to me was because it really highlighted how this extraordinary climate of fear has been created in the United States. WikiLeaks is a group that had never been, and still has never been, charged with a crime, let alone convicted of one. And they couldn't be, because what they're doing is pure First Amendment activity that the New York Times and the Washington Post, in theory, do every day, which is publish, publicize leaks that are given to them by other people. And yet, these were American citizens who were petrified of exercising core First Amendment rights, which is what donating money to an organization whose political cause you support is. And they were basically intimidated from the things we've seen over the last 10 years in terms of lawlessness um, by what the government has done from exercising these rights. So you can offer all the rights in the world on a piece of paper or a piece of parchment that you want. You don't need to eliminate those rights if you can intimidate and bully the population into refraining from exercising them. And this really occurred to me even more when I wrote for the first time about the extremely harsh and oppressive conditions in which Bradley Manning was being detained. And I remember when I first wrote about it, a lot of people wondered, and I actually even wondered myself, why would the Obama administration basically turn Bradley Manning into almost a martyr and even jeopardize its own ability to prosecute him by subjecting him to this extremely severe, um, you could call it torture, but at the very least it's inhumane treatment. He was in prolonged solitary confinement for nine months despite being convicted of nothing. His clothes were taken from him. He was stripped nude and forced to stand naked for uh, many of those days. Um, just completely punitive measures. And at some point shortly thereafter, I realized that the reason that that was done was the same reason that the Bush administration took people who were completely innocent by the hundreds and shipped them thousands of miles away to a Caribbean island and dressed them in orange jumpsuits and sackles and showed the world what we had done. It's a way of signaling to the world and to would-be challengers to American power, both domestically and internationally, that we are not constrained by law. We don't have any limits on what we can do. If you're somebody who thinks about challenging what we can do, take a look at these pictures of people like Guantanamo who are going to be there for as long as we want to keep them there, even if they're innocent. Or if you're somebody who discovers wrongdoing and serious illegality on the, at the highest levels of our government and you want to expose it to the world, think about and look at what we've done to Bradley Manning or what we're now doing to WikiLeaks without any even pretense to legal authority and without any constraint whatsoever. It's really the use of law as a means of coercion.